so many things AI have happened like all at once. And because all of them are happening all at once, let's just record like an all things AI episode. And let's talk about the Google AI and workspace and the Microsoft AI that they're calling Copilot. And let's talk a little bit about Khan Academy's implementation of AI in their learning model. Let's talk about this thing called Alpaca and unfurl of what Stanford is doing with it. Let's talk about Meta's implementation called Llama. Let's just unfurl this whole AI hotspots that we have. So let's talk all things AI. Welcome to the Thought Bistro podcast with Akhil and Vishrut. Here we bring you the weekly news, book reviews and world views from a different lens. Our mission is to provide a platform to explore different ideas and different perspectives and allow you, our listeners, to develop a deeper understanding. As Akhil just mentioned, there's a whole slew of stuff that we have to talk about. We're going to be following up with GPT-4 and all the developments that have been happening in that front. There is Stanford, which has come out with Alpaca. There is Facebook and Meta, which have come out with Llama. There's Google Workspace and how they are planning to integrate their existing Palm AI with Google Workspace. And obviously there's Microsoft with Copilot, which is an upgrade from how they integrated Bing and ChatGPT. So I think to get started, we could, we should just look at what is known, what we have spoken about before. And I would say, let's just start with ChatGPT and GPT-4. So I'm just going to start us off with something that just happened recently, wherein my sister, who's studying undergraduate physics at Columbia University, had an issue. She was trying to solve a problem set and she thought, why not use ChatGPT to do some of the basic calculations and things like that that are associated with my problem set. A few minutes later, she told me ChatGPT has failed completely. It doesn't have the basic understanding of physics. And I don't think as a physicist, I would ever want to use that again. This got me to think about a certain thing. And here she mentioned very specifically saying that had I not known what the right answer should be, or had I not been aware of the area of which I was asking ChatGPT to answer the question, so that that, that area of physics with regards to which her question was, I wouldn't have known the answer that ChatGPT has given me is wrong. So inherently, she had to be aware of what she was expecting out of ChatGPT for her to understand that the answer that was given was right or wrong. Now, ChatGPT, as we mentioned earlier in in our last episode, OpenAI very clearly accepts that there are times where ChatGPT gets things wrong. It gets facts wrong. It doesn't have the required documentation to answer certain things correctly. But this just took me back to the discussion that happens with almost everybody whom I speak to about ChatGPT. They say that we humans are going to become irrelevant. However, this has just taught me that that might not be the case. We still have to have our expertise. You know, a tool is a tool is a tool. It goes in circles. What happens is we start using a tool and then it develops into something else. And then we start using that tool. You can start, we can go back to the example which... I don't even know, three episodes, four episodes I've used this, but start with a spoon, go to a shovel, go to a crane, you know, dig a hole in the earth and then dig a hole at, on Mars. But a tool is a tool is a tool, right? So just like that, today ChatGPT is doing this based on the knowledge it has and we are trying to find answers with the ChatGPT. Firstly, also to clarify, yeah, your sister used ChatGPT, right? Not GPT-4. No, no, this is GPT 3.5, the basic free version. There's not any premium, no no payment, no no GPT-4 knowledge. Right. So your sister is using this model, right? And the expectations from the model are a little beyond what the model is currently capable of. But these are supervised learning models. And eventually she'll give it some more knowledge and that knowledge will dissolve within the data set. And then she will, uh, the tool will know a little bit more then your sister is going to have even more expanded expectations. You know, now I am trying to find answer to this problem. Next, I will assume that this problem's answer is a given. And then what's the next step that I can ask it? It becomes like a lovely initially calculators come in, abacuses come in, we use it to do addition and subtraction. Then calculators come in and then, you know, suddenly we are doing all sorts of nonsense on those. And then Python comes in and the whole world just flips on its head. I think it's going to be a similar story. And I don't think humanity becomes irrelevant. Just we evolve. Our thinking evolves and we just go to the next step. 
In fact, talking about GPT-4, I saw the live stream for GPT-4 by OpenAI. And that is some crazy implementation, you know. So they have two boxes. On the left is a box where you tell the program what you expect from it. If you remember the steerability part that we spoke about in our last episode, there's that box essentially is the steerability. You're giving the bot a role. You're telling it, okay, this is what you are. For example, if I tell Akhil today, Akhil today, you are my economics teacher. You have to assume that role and you have to teach me a certain concept. And Akhil has to assume that role and everything I ask him or everything I speak to him, he has to answer to me as if he were my economics teacher. Then I can change that role to say, Akhil, today you are from medieval England and you have to talk to me in old Shakespeare in English. So he has to make sure that he answers every single question or whatever conversation we're having, he has to continue with that old English. So that is one role. A lovely example and a very, very implementable example was that the presenter asked in that box, today you are tax GPT. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to help me with my tax. So since GPT-4 was only trained up to 2021, what that person did is he took the tax code for 2022 from New York and he fed that tax code into GPT-4. And instead of saying learn this or whatever, he just copied it and pasted it in GPT-4. After that, GPT-4 read through all of the tax code and pops. That was about 60 pages of text. It was long, right? And GPT-4 is able to take some 100x the amount of text that GPT-3.5 can. And this will just keep increasing day by day, day by day, right? But now GPT-4 completely understood the tax. And then this guy just asked that uh, we are a couple, we have a child, blah, blah, blah. What is our tax liability? What do we do here? This is practically replacing a CPA in your life. And I was discussing with my brother-in-law, as we do usually, that if a business wants a marketing person or anything to do with thought, you know, a service which is thought-based, then this can replace that just the base level analytics of it. You want marketing ideas or you want marketing implementations, you want some code, you want to build a website. And this is where, you know, let's switch from GPT-4 to Google Workspaces and to Microsoft Copilot because they slide right into this conversation. Google Workspace has a very amazing thing where it says that during a Google Meet meeting, you can ask it to take notes and it will keep up, keep taking notes as you are having a meeting with say two, three, four of your colleagues. It will create a checklist for you to say, okay, these are the tasks that were discussed in the meeting. You know, these are the topics that you all spoke about. These are the questions you had which were resolved. These are the questions you had which were not resolved. So you have that entire thing. If you missed a meeting, you can ask your AI bot to summarize that meeting and give you a recap in the future. It'll give you an exact recap as to what happened during that meeting. Furthermore, in that meeting, if it has been discussed, you need to form some kind of a document or you have to make some kind of a brief regarding anything. It'll just put that in a Google Docs. If you want it to look pretty, it'll just make it look pretty. If you want it to be made with images, it will generate images, AI images, and put it on the doc itself. If you want a PowerPoint presentation out of that, it'll just take it to Google Slides and make a PowerPoint presentation for you. Dude, forget PowerPoint presentation. You have a thread of emails with someone which is about 50, 60 emails long and you ask it to summarize that thread and it'll give you a summary. This is the summary and you can ask it to create a response which is quirky or funny or uh, somber or you can, you know, you can give it moods. That is insane. I understand how that can, you know, be looked in a very negative way. Being like, oh yeah, now people are not going to pay attention in meetings and people are just going to use this and Everything is available at a touch of a button. So people are going to become more lackadaisical and more absent-minded during these meetings. But imagine the positives. Imagine you have a, you're running a company and you have your product placed in maybe, I think the example showed 2,400 different locations. But imagine you have a product placed in like maybe 15 or 20 websites and you've updated the product's pictures. You can ask your AI bot to update that same picture in all the places that your product is displayed. So much, so much time is wasted during a job doing all of these menial things. 
it is wasted making these documents it is wasted making powerpoint presentations we spend such a long time educating ourselves in finance and financial models and most of the time during the job like during my investment banking time it was spent making powerpoint presentations and spent forming these emails and making the emails look professional all of that if it's being taken care of by ai or all of that you know which you would personally give to like a lower level financial analyst or an intern that you know fix uh, this is what i want to send out just form a proper email or form a proper format or like form a this powerpoint for me if that's all taken care of imagine the efficiency that you can generate in your job you can put your mind where it is required so my sister does these resin art projects and in this resin art project she's very passionate about this and her work is absolutely lovely but after spending so long on the resin art then she needs to sit with her phone in her backyard with her camera and like make it presentable to instagram she's like akhil i don't like doing that part you know i am the resin artist and that's what i wish to do but i need to do all of the rest of it in order for it to be presentable and give it to the world here what she can do is form her art take a couple of photos from around just generic lighting couple of photos google enhances it with ai forms a video of it makes her a website because google has this thing called vertex ai which is going to be available to the public very soon in which uh, what my sister can do she can take a couple of photos for it forms a video for her and makes her a powerpoint presentation makes her a website which is transactable the transactions happen via google pay gives her a chatbot that chatbot can recommend what would look good in somebody's house and you know which resin product would looks good in her, somebody's house if she has retailers around the person wherever you know the person is searching from it will give it retailers physical retailers around her because everything is linked with google maps just imagine the world where all of this is taken care for her while an artist can focus on their art us as podcasters we spend so much time on the bloody youtube thumbnail i think i read a line today which makes all of this make a lot of sense they say people today struggle to find free time there is this very popular line oh i am so busy i wish i had more time so they say activity makes one busy but productivity leads to more free time i think this is exactly what not even just google i think even microsoft copilot ditto 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 two two products which are replaceable by yeah i think it's probably twins who are just named differently and like you know are part of different companies but from whatever i was reading they seem to be just one stone split into two one half is with google one half is with microsoft pretty much yeah yeah i think they're just aiming to make us as productive as we can i think this is going to definitely lead to a lot of debate a lot of ethical debate is going to take place a lot of people are going to be very unhappy with this because they'll be like our employees will get very lazy they will not pay attention and they won't be actively listening to every single thing because they have something to fall back on but imagine that something to fall back on is so brilliant because if in case you've missed something you've forgotten something there is that safety net which is helping you out which is giving you that prompt saying that hey you've missed this point i see it so often the where i work most of the problems happen thanks to these menial tasks as long as you get those menial tasks correct the entire framework builds up from there the end goal of everything of all of consumption of all of capitalism of all of development is quality of life if a tool can help more people do what they love and focus on what they love then that is the end all be all of what we are all aiming for the end goal of a corporation is higher efficiency and higher productivity if a corporation can achieve the same with lesser number of people instead of saying my employees are not doing this or not doing that the employees will have more avenues to search maybe go on a deeper search right now there is no food issue in a lot of developed countries food housing water these are like thoughts of the past right it is primarily because of technology development 
it is primarily because there are things that have gone into place where all of these menial tasks have been taken care of the thing is organizations companies don't run on these presentations or these documents or these emails these are just the very small things they don't care how well that is done or who has done it it has to just live up to that certain standard there are a few boxes that it has to check there are a few key points that have to be included in it and that's the way it is for example we were looking at a few architects for our house and the architects sent us a proposal in which they had their terms and conditions now what had they done for their terms and conditions they googled some random architect terms and conditions copied it pasted it and sent it to us and my dad being extremely detail oriented was like nope we're going to go through this point by point by point and edit everything that doesn't work for us now these architects were like you are the first person who has actually looked at these terms and conditions in such detail usually people just sign it and be done with it the architect doesn't care that you know that terms and conditions is perfect rather than hiring someone to draft a terms and conditions for each and every client they were like you know what we're just going to take something off of google and give it to people whoever cares about it we'll make the necessary changes and they were very accommodating to all the changes that we had but it was just such a an eye opener for me because they are saving on that one employee who would be sitting drafting terms and conditions for each and every client that they have and that is essentially what gpt is now going to be doing for you or google workspace is going to be going to be doing for you or copilot is going to be doing for you it is taking away the menial it is taking away that extra one two three interns that we hire so some awesome use case scenarios from your description by itself is google posted this one use case scenario where you will go into google docs and you will just ask google i want to post a job on linkedin give me job responsibilities or just draft a job description for me to post on linkedin for this role in this role i expect this people to do this at the end of the day you have a full job description cut copy paste so something that would have probably taken you an hour or hour and a half or oh, takes more man no 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 an hour is not enough we have had this uh, we did this in the uh, our canadian unit it takes a lot of time to draft these job descriptions and looking at other companies job description then all of this you know being taken care of is bliss i was going on to say that that you know you would ideally if say you had to draft this by yourself you would take maybe two or three job descriptions which were similar to the role that you were looking at copy them paste them into a document and then go through editing those things that you liked about say proposal a that you needed 0.123 proposal b you needed 0.789 proposal c you needed 0.56 proposal d you needed point 4 so you know you would create a mix and match and you know edit and cut and trim and paste and fix and get to a final result do lawyers are so expensive you can give something like gpt4 in the future which is definitely going to be available to all you can give something like gpt4 the law books and once you give it the law books of the year after that you can ask gpt4 to draft you something that completely covers you of legal liabilities Uh, ask you an employment agreement that covers your legal liabilities where there are no loopholes left within your organization or you can uh, take one that you got from an employer and you can put put it into gpt4 and ask gpt4 is this leaving me vulnerable to any legal liabilities it goes both ways right so suddenly you are 100% 100% and more act and more you are stronger definitely for people who would require these expertise maybe once in a while for example if you were a employee going into a company and you have to sign an agreement you probably don't ever require a lawyer again you don't need to know a lawyer you may not want to spend that amount of money that it takes for you want to go and meet a lawyer and ask them to look at the document here you just have to upload the document upload the legal code and be like hey this is what i am being asked to sign is this okay and you are giving it the legal code you are not assuming any knowledge that chat gpt or gpt 3.5 or gpt 4 has inherently this is something that you are physically feeding into the machine for it to read and learn and parse at that given point in time vishod on a personal note whenever i was in the us and whenever you had to deal with this immigration stuff 
and now that I, I am going to Canada and we have to deal with all of this immigration mumbo jumbo, right? This mumbo jumbo is ever evolving. It evolves on a monthly or a weekly basis. There is always something new. Always there is an update. And even if you go to like immigration consultants or you go to immigration lawyers, they are uh, not updated on everything because their education at one point ends, right? You can't always find the best ones. Now you have certain questions which in the case of immigration are generally very case specific and they are specific to yourself. More often than not, these questions are going to be case specific because why will you and I just be curious about immigration out of the blue? We're only going to be curious when something goes wrong. Right, and not everybody has the resources, man, to go out and hire somebody. It becomes very expensive and then you don't know which person is milking you. You know, you don't know who is just hanging you about so that you keep paying the hourly fees and you are just trapped within this. It is it is a difficult world to live in and when all of these things can be automated or can be semi-automated or can be at least looked at because right now if you look at law books, you'll just be confused in the language by itself. Exactly. I think that's the best way to put it that for someone who just needs an opinion, I think this is just a starting point. Nobody is saying this is going to be the be all and end all. Nobody is saying you're not going to lead lawyers in tomorrow's world. But for someone who does not know the ABCs of law, this can still provide a basic idea that, hey, this is where this document leaves you vulnerable or this is the thing you need to watch out for. Or if you're going to a particular lawyer, maybe check this out. It gives you a place to focus. Similar to as we were saying earlier that, you know, it gives you a starting point from where to begin your writing with maybe more case-specific stuff like immigrations or legal, you know, indemnity and things like that. It may just give you an area to focus on, a part of the document. You know, you often read, oh, they had this hidden in the fine print. What is that fine print? It may help you just to understand that fine print. Another awesome, awesome use case scenario that was displayed by Microsoft Copilot, and this one maybe is more awesome to me than to anybody else, is they showed the capabilities of Excel. And in Excel, you can do a number of things, most of which nobody knows because everything is hidden behind menu bars. You have to press this, then this, then this, then this, then select this, then do this, and then this, and then maybe it will happen what you're hoping will happen. You know, it, it is gets very, very confusing. Very, very fast. Instead of that, you have a chatbot and you have all the data which is just printed on your screen and you say, can I get the growth rate on this data? He'll give you the growth rate. Okay. Can you put this growth rate in a table? It will put it in a table. I'm not liking how this looks. Can you color code it? It will color code it for you. Can you give me a graph on this color coded table? It will give you a graph. I would like these colors, make them jazzy. It will make the colors jazzy. It was so beautiful to see that being done. We, we have something called a regression in finance, you know. Explaining it will take a lot of time. But there is something called regression. I think everybody who has done ninth grade or 10th grade math would have a basic idea what a regression is. So it's basically you form a graph and you draw a line in the middle of it. That is called regression. Getting to that line is such a big hassle in Excel. Someday try, sit and do a regression on Excel. People will, you know, snatch their brains out. Now to do a regression, I have these two data sets, run a regression, then run a regression. You know, I was doing this project on Python where I needed some data from a couple of stocks. And then I wanted the data from the market. And then I wanted to compare the two. Getting that data in Python is a hassle, firstly. Secondly, thinking about, you know, the tabular form of data in your head to run it in Python is another hassle. Here, as usual, get me data from S&P 500, got it there, get me data from this stock, this stock, run a regression. My time, it would have taken me like an hour to do all of this, is now cut into three sentences, which would hardly take me 30 seconds to form. Just imagine how many different things a person can think of if you have this kind of a superpower. And imagine where it will evolve to. If it is coming now, then in a couple of years, what is going to happen? Just amazing. Dude, I'm honestly just trying to wrap my brains around it all. I think there is so much happening. There is so much that we have only found out in the last 48 hours of however long it... No, it's been a little longer than that. But... 
I think the most brilliant thing of this whole bit is that you and I can train our own language model using our computers, using our existing setup. And that has just blown my mind. So this is, we should transition into something called alpaca. And alpaca is another beautiful thing that is happening. It has come from the minds of people at Stanford. Now, what alpaca is doing is, so Facebook or Meta, the company, which is Facebook basically, has publicly released Llama, large language model Meta AI, which is a state of the art foundational large language model designed to help researchers advance their work in this subfield of AI. It's a bunch of data. And what Stanford people have done is they have used Facebook's data and using Facebook's data, they have asked ChatGPT to train itself better on Facebook's data, make it itself more efficient and make itself cheaper. And somehow they have succeeded. So the cost cutting that was expected from ChatGPT over the next decade has been done today by Alpaca. And it has been done on GPT 3.5, but at that point, GPT 4 was not out. Now they are planning, why don't we do it with GPT 4 and just train it on Google's API, which is Palm, which is like 500 times bigger set of data than Meta's or Facebook's. And you can just run it at your home. They say it is supposed to be free. It is only for research, only for educational purposes. It states in chat GPT's model as well as in Meta's model that do not use it for commercial purposes. But once everybody has it in their homes, does anybody really, you know, care? <laughs> just for credibility's sake, Alpaca is being done by Stanford. So it's not some random person claiming this. This is Stanford University. <laughs> So I think we can be pretty rest assured in the fact that it is going to work. It is genius to ask AI to train itself using newer model to be more efficient because, you know, humans might not be capable enough of doing this fast enough. Do it All now. this is open source. You can do it on your computer today. It is available. Stanford have released the Git repository on their website. You can just open the GitHub repository on your computer, download it, branch it, do whatever you want. There's detailed instructions on how to run it. It just takes about 35 GB of space. And $100. So just make sure, yeah, just make sure you have that amount of space. That and 100 bucks, and you have GPT, GPT 3.5 running natively on your computer where you can alter it. You can train it with a different model, different data, higher data, train it with GPT 4. Go ahead. I remember with Hamil, we spoke about this and he was talking about how hard it would be to train it and how there are some open source training AIs out there and how difficult it is, what the setup you need. And he was giving us full system requirements and things like that, which we thought was going to be impossible for any normal human being to have. And here we go, two and a half months later, two and a half months later. I just love it. It is amazing. It is, I think, from both our tones, it's just giving it away how excited we are about this. I know we sound like two kids who've been left in a candy store and have like been jacked up on sugar. But this is just how it is. We're like, we're astounded at the possibilities. All I've been doing is reading about what is happening in this AI world. And I just keep smiling. And my sister that just thinks I've gone crazy. She looks at me. She's like, why are you smiling? You need to stop smiling because, you know, the AI is just so crazy. Dude, my sister, when my sister came up to me and she was like, your chat GPT, that just cracked me up. <laughs> because for my family, chat GPT has just become my thing because that's all I've been talking about. Our friend and loyal viewer, Dinesh Gajwani, has told us that, you know, you guys should be the brand ambassadors for chat GPT. Open AI, we're open to sponsorships. He's saying, I do not think Microsoft is advertising chat GPT as well as you guys are. I think now we're going to start advertising Alpaca because the thumbnail of this video or this podcast is going to be your know, Alpaca, Alpaca, you know, and it is so cool. This thing is wearing goggles and looking all cool about it. So, you know, it has to be our thumbnail. Dude, 100% man. I've never seen such a cool looking Alpaca. But then again, this is Stanford University. So I don't think we're getting advertiser revenue from here either. It's fine. They still deserve all the love. 
for making humanity better. It's just crazy. And they called it alpaca because Facebook called it a llama and they're like, alpacas are just better than llamas. So we got to name it alpaca. Yeah, I think they come from the same family. Yes. Yeah, they look the same as well. Yeah, very similar. In fact, Stanford University in one of the examples has asked the AI, what is an alpaca? How is it different from a llama? And the answer is on your screen right now if you're watching the YouTube video. If you're listening to the podcast, go to the YouTube video and go to the timestamp. I'll leave the timestamp in the description. Answer is on your, on your screen. An alpaca is a domesticated species of a South American camelid related to the llama and the vicuña. It is smaller than a llama and has finer and softer fleece. Alpaca are raised for their fleece, which is used to make knitted and woven garments. So they're essentially the same thing. And now you know. Yeah, man, I didn't want our Spotify viewers to leave us thinking that we're only prioritizing YouTube. Hopefully I duped some of them. Evil, evil person. So I think that brings us to the end of our waffling. I think we've bored you all enough. If you stayed with us so long, thank you so much. We really appreciate you all sticking through the madness, sticking through the laughter, the excitement, the amazement, if I can say that. I think the speed at which this is happening and the speed at, at which everything is happening, we have another AI episode in what, two more days when some new big breakthrough is going to happen and the world is going to break apart again. So till then... Do like, share and subscribe and see you all next time. Adios amigos. Thanks for joining us. We hope to continue to bring you some interesting news from around the world and keep you informed and keep you entertained and hope to see you again next time. Thank you.